Hey guys, welcome back to the Battlefield Theologian YouTube channel. My name is Ethan Jago, and thank you for joining me in this Introduction to Hermeneutics class. If you like this, please hit subscribe, turn on the notification buttons as more classes will be coming out. But today we're going to be continuing on with our practical approach to interpreting the Bible. So with this, we've already left off as to what is the occasion of the writing. Now we're going to be looking at, we need to understand, when you approach the text, if you're looking at a verse or if you have a verse that you're wrestling with, I need to understand, first and foremost, what is the context of the chapter, right? Instead of just isolating one verse, I need to look at the broader scope of the whole as, what does the chapter mean? Uh, how does this writer convey his thought in this section? Uh, does this chapter support an additional chapter? Is, is it building off of itself? And once you understand the author's style of writing, it makes it very easy uh, or a lot less hard uh, for you to go back and to understand what is actually being said here within the context of that chapter. Uh, so look at the chapters preceding it, look at the chapters following it, and that will help you figure out the context of the chapter where your verse that you're studying lies in. So once you get that, then I look at the context of the verse. That's the next step, context of the verse. What does this verse say? Literally, what does it say? Uh, is this verse referring to or alluding to something else previously written? Uh, and we're going to do some examples later on to help as I walk you guys through this. Now, an item to be cautious with uh, is what is known as proof texting. A lot of people do this, sadly, and proof texting is taking an isolated verse out of the context of it in relation to the passage. Why do they do this? To support an intended belief or a biblical point, and you hear this a lot of times from the pulpit, is I got a sermon, I just need a verse for it, or I got to find a verse, and people like pick and choose whatever they want to support whatever they desire the verse to mean, and that's, you can't do that. Just don't do it, please. All right, next one, identify the people involved. What are the names within this book? Uh, what are the names in the chapter? What are the names in the verse? This is important because a lot of times, especially Luke, uh, as he's writing, uh, he will be referring back to, which if you look at Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, and Acts chapter 10, uh, we see Peter's injected in Acts 8. He's not really mentioned again until the end of verse uh, chapter 9, and then he picks back up into chapter 10. So we need to be seeing where and what characters are involved, what subjects are involved. And one thing I always like to do is, as I'm in a chapter or in a verse, I write down subjects, and I write down any person uh, that is listed, or if there's even a proper name in there too, where it's not like the actual person's name, like the Ethiopian eunuch. I, I, I would write down from Acts chapter eight, the Ethiopian eunuch. That's a subject that is being mentioned in this section of the text. So identify the people involved. Next thing we need to look at is identify the actions. I'm telling you guys, this is key. Identify the actions. Find the verbs. Now, once you find the verbs, answer them, and this kind of works in English, but it makes more sense too as you start to deep uh, go deeper into your studies is find the verbs. Are they action verbs? And what are the adverbs? Uh, because when you start to get into the Greek language, you have the indicative, right? And then you have the imperative. Uh, and that gets to be very important too as to see did this already occur or is this still ongoing? Uh, and so we need to be cautious not to apply English grammatical rules into the Greek, but please don't even worry about that. We're only talking English right now. Okay, the next step is how would the intended audience have understood this statement? What level of specificity did the author give in the original application? So when Paul's writing the church in Corinth, put all sexual immorality away from you, well, how would they have taken that? Well, sexual morality at that time was going up to the temple, sleeping with prostitutes and everything else for the sacrificing and or giving worship to false gods. So, ah, okay, that's how that church would have understood that, but there's still transcultural applications for us today. Now, is what is being said in this biblical passage common knowledge? Would the audience have known what was being said? Yes, yes, and there's several sections in the New Testament where Peter is writing in 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16, as he is referencing Paul's letters, and he is writing in a way in which his recipients would have understood, yes, yes, we understand Paul's letters are in circulation at this time. So it's really important and it's really a key for you to keep that in mind, is how would the audience uh, have understood this? Was it common knowledge or not? Now, the next section or the next point under this, how would the intended audience have understood the statement is, would it have or how would people have interacted with this idea or concept previously? Is this a new concept that has never been taught before or is this a, a concept that has been constantly touched on multiple times throughout the New Testament or in the Old Testament? 
And the next section is, and this is, I think, a very important, crucial one. I mean, all of them are important. Is the text, is the verse normative or descriptive? What do I mean by normative? Normative means describing the way something should be done, right? A command, such as you will baptize, or you will, when you pray, you will pray this way, or this and that. It, it's normative, like this, there's no question about it, this is how it is to be done. Or is it descriptive? Is the text describing something that is, but is only unique for that audience? So here's why this is important. Normative means it's transcultural and it will apply to us today. Descriptive means that that is left within that culture and it's written for us to understand that. All right, so that's what that means. And then the last point, in this crazy? The last thing that you're doing as you're doing an approach to the text is asking the question, what is the meaning? A lot of people go in right at the beginning trying to figure out the meaning, but they didn't do any of this other legwork, and so they will always arrive, most likely, unless they get super, super lucky, at a wrong or a false meaning. What is the meaning? The meaning, the definition of meaning, refers to the ideas of the biblical text that was originally intended to communicate to its readers. So the original thought that the author wrote, what it meant to the original readers. Then the next thing is the significance. What is the significance of the passage? This refers to the implications of that meaning in a different or later situation. So then you ask the question as you're approaching this text, all right, what's the implication? Uh, how do I apply this for practice? How do I apply the meaning for theory? Uh, and the text must support your findings. So what I like to do is I write out the implications, like I think this is what this is talking about, but then I go back to the text to hold me in check. And then the next thing is, what is the application? Is the application only for the people in the writing, meaning it's only descriptive, uh, or is it normative, meaning we can find meaning in this today? Uh, there may not always be a personal application in every phrase and sentence of scripture, but there's definitely principles and implications that you can have in your life. Um, this application, uh, an application approach of very genre to genre, uh, and it must apply to the text within the context as a part of a larger meaningful linguistic utterance. What do I mean by that? Is that the authors of the New Testament in the Old Testament didn't just write a verse and then it makes no sense. Like, you know, when you look at John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. It's not like Luke is talking about something else, or excuse me, John's talking about something else and randomly Jesus wept. Okay, carrying on. No, no. It will make sense logically, right? So, another thing to, I guess, help you out here, just some, some helpful tips here. Uh, when you approach the epistles, right? Here's a tip that I like to use when you're approaching any of the pastoral epistles that Paul wrote, John, anyone else. This places demands on our lives that are applicable today, right? When you look at the epistles, that places demands on Christian living that applies to us today. When you look at genealogies, right? When you look at 1 Chronicles 1 through 12, does a genealogy apply to me today? No, it does not have a direct application. However, the implication identifies within the genealogies here is the providence of God guiding these generations. So hopefully that makes sense. Check me out next time in this video as we will look at examples in scriptural passages.